This is Thursday night and the big test. The river beats against the levees and the bridges with a thudding hum, like a great heartbeat. The river sort of seems to strum on the steel of the bridge. One giant searchlight slowly sweeps the dark levees, giving a few seconds of light to the men working in the night. All through the black hours, from its stationary mount on the Douglas Street Bridge, this light throws its white beam over the areas where men have spent hours of sweat, where men now wait to see if they will win or lose. It was Thursday night, April 17th, 1952. The reporter, Edward R. Murrow. The river is placid now, but back then it produced a flood of record proportions. Never before had so much water come down the Missouri River at one time. And the battle was centered here, along the banks and levees on the Omaha and Council Bluff sides of the river. The river begins to flood here at a depth of 19 feet. In 1952, at its crest, the river was just over 30 feet high. This year marks the 30th anniversary of that flood, and for the next half hour, with the help of Edward R. Murrow and some of the local people who remember it, we're going to relive what happened back then. Murrow, considered by many the father of broadcast journalism, spent a week here covering the great Missouri River flood. The mud could have been in Korea, Arnhem, or the Bulge. These are Air Force boys. They're loading sandbags on a barge. The Air Force is responsible for a stretch of five miles of levee here. As you see, the men are all wearing their May Wests because when these sandbags are towed out on the barge, they will go with it. The Civil Defense Organization trained 400 auxiliary police. Here's one of them at the Council Bluffs end of the Douglas Street We're Bridge. We're on the bridge between Omaha and Council Bluffs. And this is Claude Cole standing beside me. Claude, uh, you're directing traffic. Right. How long have you been on this job? Well, about 21 hours right now. How long have you been driving this thing? It's uh, Saturday morning. You know what day it is now? Uh, I think it's about Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> As the river nears its crest, everything that can be done had been done. The houses are defenseless. The people are on the levees. The testing time is approaching. Marquette and Joliet came down this river in 1673, the first white men to see it. Father Marquette wrote, floating islands came rushing at us. I have never seen anything more frightful. The Missouri is longer than the Mississippi, three times longer than the Tennessee. It starts up in western Montana at Three Forks, near the Canadian border. Before it meets the Mississippi near St. Louis, it winds through seven states and almost 2,500 miles. This river has had many names. The River of Empire, the Big Muddy, the Smoky Water, and the obscene words given it by angry men who fought it. Last week, it was once again the wild Missouri, and it was rising. The river is predictable. The crest headed down from the Yellowstone River on April 4. Flood stage at Bismarck. Then Pierre, South Dakota on April 9. Sioux City, Iowa, a week ago today. The Missouri at Sioux City on Sunday was no tightly corseted torrent of water. It spread like a brown stain over the rich farmland. It scrubbed highways off the map was better than 15 miles wide. Some of the bridges stood, but they could be reached only by boat. From Sioux City, the river carves the border between Nebraska and Iowa, down to Omaha and Council Bluffs, a hundred miles away. Here is the bottleneck, the narrow part of the hourglass, where the river is only 1,200 feet wide. On the west side, Omaha. On the east, Council Bluffs. Former Nebraska Congressman Glenn Cunningham was mayor of Omaha at that time. The industrial area of Omaha uh, lies right west of the river. 
and that's, uh, for example, eating metal products, uh, the alcohol plant down here, the Jones Street electrical generating plant, Paxton Veerling, and this whole area, and, and I should mention, of course, more important probably than any of them is the Union Pacific Railroad shops and all of the trackage that is down in this area. Uh, we were also concerned about the airport. Uh, it could have done a tremendous amount of damage to the airport also if we hadn't been able to contain it. Uh, how many millions of dollars uh, it would have cost the, the people involved and the city if it hadn't been contained is almost hard to imagine what the total would be, but it would be a tremendous amount in the multi-millions. So uh, that's what we were concerned about, uh, the industrial area. We didn't feel that uh, with the information we had that it would go as far as the downtown business district. Our major concern was down here where the industrial heart of Omaha is and was at that time. On the other side of the river, Jim Mulqueen had been mayor of Council Bluffs for just four days when the flood warning came. I had no experience at fighting floods. I didn't have any experience at being a mayor. And uh, that is a hell of a way to break in a mayor. We were trying to contain that Missouri River, keep it within the borders of the river, keep it below the flashboard. But we were vitally concerned that if it got away from the bed that it was supposed to stay in, that we would have lost the whole west section and south section of Council Bluffs. And so one of the first things that we were forced to do was to evacuate over 30,000 people who lived in those areas. And we had to do it fast. As I recall, we uh, got uh, volunteers to come in there with trucks and drivers and movers and we moved all of those people and their furniture out within less than 48 hours. The low-lying part of the city is completely deserted. They took out the furniture, the refrigerators, even the window curtains. You can look straight through the houses. There is silence. And if the levees break, there will be 10, 15 feet of water in these streets. Sandbags are dirty and they're heavy. And they're the ammunition used against the river. The whole country around Omaha and Council Bluffs is sand and clay. On Monday, they were filling 5,000 sandbags an hour. On Wednesday, it was 8,000. And by Thursday, 15,000 sandbags an hour, 24 hours a day. This was the story of men and machines against the river. There are some things a machine can't do. And one of them is to place a sandbag in the right place at the right time. A sandbag makes all men equal. Sometimes a sandbag is thrown at the river and the river throws it right back. The roller coaster stands as a sort of monument to happier and more carefree days. In this area, it was decided to build a secondary levee 300 yards long, 30 feet high. It was done in a little less than six hours. Truck drivers didn't know what day of the week it was. I'm Paul Nelson from Omigo, Kansas, and we've been working 48 hours without any rest. I'm Mrs. Irene Nelson from Omigo, Kansas, and I work 22 hours with two hours of rest. I'm beginning to get tired and sleepy. That's a Logan from South Boston, Massachusetts. Been here three days. Where are you from? Pennsylvania. California. I'm from Council Bluffs. Oregon. They ate with one hand and shifted gears with the other. Sandwich or water? Sandwich, no water. So far as we know, there wasn't a single casualty in the Omaha Council Bluffs area. The evacuation from the low-lying areas was smooth and efficient. We didn't dare tell anybody this. We had an airplane rigged with sirens on it. If any part of that dike broke, there'd be no stopping it. And that siren was the signal that everybody was to, in some way, get to the higher ground. It's just like running a city under martial law. Back on the Omaha side, the man in charge of coordination was Civil Defense Director Sam Reynolds. 
Given special power by the governor under a state civil defense law, Reynolds could take just about any action he deemed necessary, no matter whose toes were stepped on. Along the riverfront, Reynolds remembers construction of a dike that threatened what was then an operating alcohol manufacturing plant. When he put this dike in, the manager over there called up and he said, well, I'm in a fine mess now. What do you mean? Well, he said, if the river does break through, I'll get all the backwater. So what? Well, I've got a lot of alcohol here. Oh, we forgot about that. We've got all the gasoline off and oil off the tanks out of the river. But alcohol floating on the river is just as much a fire hazard as gasoline. But you better get that alcohol and put it in tank trucks and take it up on high ground. Well, I don't know. I said, well, I'm boss. I'm ordering you to. I'll send you a written order. Calls up the next day. He says, now I am in a jam. What's the matter? Well, he says, I got the alcohol in tank trucks, but the feds won't let me move. I said, who the hell are the feds? Well, he says, you know, you can't move alcohol without the government. I said, I never heard of the government. You move it on high ground, and I'll take care of the feds. He said, Reynolds, you mean for once in my life I can tell those so-and-sos to go to hell? <laughs> the dike was around OPPD's Jones Street plant, which supplied virtually all of Omaha's electrical power. And it was Reynolds who ordered the dike built on top of the Burlington Railroad's mainline tracks. Special secondary dikes are built to protect the power plant. Built right over the railroad tracks. There are bank clerks, insurance salesmen, mechanics, college boys. Their offices and factories have given them leave. Or they've already done their day's work and have now volunteered to fight on the river. My name is Fred Bloomer. I work for a large insurance company here in Omaha, Nebraska. I sit behind what they call a desk all day long. When this emergency arose, we feel that these here are the people that we have to serve throughout our life, and so we are down here working. Many of us men have worked for, like myself, we finished up last night on a 36-hour shift with about one and a half hours of sleep. We came out bright and early this morning, expecting to go till it's over with. My name's Joe Cedar. Uh, I live in this vicinity, and uh, I would like to express my appreciation for the uh, excellent help we who do live here have received. How long do you think you can stand this pace? Well, as long as they want to go, I reckon they'll get her done out here. Thanks very much. I guess I worried like everybody else, but when I saw the amount of work that was being done and the thousands of volunteers, I thought, boy, we can't lose this. These are called flashboards, about three or four feet high. They're built up on top of the levee, and then they're backed by sandbags to a depth of about six feet. As you see, the water is now almost up to the flashboards. On the other side of the river, it is up and covering part of the flashboards on top of the concrete retaining wall. Now back here, you see sand oil. Those are produced as a result of the water digging under this levee and then boiling up behind. And what they do is just put a circle of sandbags around that sand boil, and when the water reaches the level in there that it is out in the river, then the thing equalizes. You'll see also behind a secondary levee that was put there just in the course of the last few days to hold the water in case this levee on which I am now sitting should break. Those sand boils were a recurring problem, and something similar to that happened here at 13th and Gray Streets in Omaha. It's remembered as the Gray Street sewer blowout. It provided one of the most dramatic moments in the fight against the flood, actually two days after the crest had passed. A sewer runs underneath the street here, large enough so you could drive two cars through it side by side. The river, about a quarter of a mile in that direction, was, of course, way above the level of the sewer. Water was backed up into the sewer under tremendous pressure, so much so that it literally blew through the street here. Well, that, of course, had the potential of undoing everything. This is the Gray Street sewer outlet as it looks today. The man in charge of raising the levees to keep the water out of Omaha remembers the water some 20 feet higher here, remembers a barge floated to this point and steel and sandbags dumped into the water to seal off the sewer. Nightfall was coming on when contractor Ed Foster got a call that all their work of the past week may have been for naught. 
When I arrived at uh, 11th and Grace, I knew that my next stop was to come down to the area where this gate structure is now. And this gate structure, incidentally, was not here then. It was just an open, two open boxes. We took those beams and dropped them from the uh, end of the barge down in front of the two boxes. And as soon as each beam came down and came into the area where the water was flowing through, the pressure of the water flow clapped the beams against the head walls of the sewer. And uh, as we dropped each one, it piled up. And after we dug them out, incidentally, they were piled up. We could see that they had done just what we expected them to do. And of course, they were some of them turned sideways, some of them lengthways, and some of them were all mixed up. But they did stop the big flow. And we dumped the barge load of rock then uh, in against those beams. And uh, with walkie-talkies, we could talk to the people down at 13th and Grace. And they told us we were making great progress. We were getting this thing stopped. And finally, we took uh, a barge load of sandbags, dropped them on the surface of the water and down into where they would go on top of the rock and the beams stopped the flow. That took uh, from the time I heard about it until we were through, uh, oh, it was maybe seven o'clock when we started and we finished at two o'clock in the morning. The crest was predicted for sometime Thursday night. Already, the river was above all time record. The river was watched, its speed was measured. The rate of flow was charted. And the experts in such matters watch the charts and graphs as a doctor studies the record of a patient in a critical condition. The human being can save a city. Omaha is going to be saved. This is Thursday night and the big test. The river beats against the levees and the bridges with a thudding hum, like a great heartbeat. The river sort of seems to strum on the steel of the bridge. One giant searchlight slowly sweeps the dark levee, giving a few seconds of light to the men working in the night. All through the black hours, from its stationary mount on the Douglas Street Bridge, this light throws its white beam over the areas where men have spent hours of sweat, where men now wait to see if they will win or lose. All during Thursday it had rained, it was cold. Midnight passed and the levees held. The night was reluctant to lift its cover from the devastation above and below Omaha, where the river spread to 17 miles. The crisis came and passed almost imperceptibly as that great river rose up and then started to settle down. And those of us who watched the river didn't know when the crest arrived. It's now 4.30 in the morning, the Missouri has crested, and if there is a certain unsteadiness in this picture, it is because of the thud and hammer of the Missouri River just below us. We are now on the bridge between Council Bluffs and Omaha, and I find myself for the first time in uh, quite some time in agreeable conversation with a couple of traffic cops. Two gentlemen who have been on this bridge for hour after hour after hour. And I will ask them uh, first to identify themselves. Your name, sir? Horace Johnson. And uh, your occupation? I'm with the J.C. Penney Company in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, let's go over here and find the other uh, friendly traffic cop at uh, 4.30 in the morning. Your name, sir? Ken Tuttle. And your occupation? Union Pacific Railroad. All the people, not just you fellows, civil defense uniforms and so forth, what stimulated this? I mean, talk to me a little about it. This, this is... Well, I've, I've seen a few wars and I've seen a few disasters. But well, I haven't seen anything quite like this. I really believe that I'm, this is the greatest part of the country and the greatest people in the world is right in here, the Midwest. They had to be tough to start it. And it's following through now of what we learned from our ancestors. This, I think, is as good a description as I have heard in the course of a very long day of what has happened in Omaha and Council Plus. By Friday morning, some of the heavy earth moving equipment had started moving south, down the river, to continue the battle. The danger was not passed, but the levees had held. 
Never before had so much water come down the Missouri. The victory belonged to no man and no organization. The river was stopped by the people. And I, I don't know how we did it, <laughs> but it was a magnificent, just magnificent, the way the people worked together and, and worked until it was, it was won. But it was a great job, but it received nationwide publicity and it shows the spirit of the people in the Midwest and particularly in our area. And I think if it were to happen again, we'd have the same response, just tremendous, overwhelming. Well, it was. I, I say that it was Omaha's finest hour. And uh, it was uh, patriotism at the uh, municipal level because everyone came out and worked uh, very hard, very diligently. And uh, just because they all did get out there and work together, they won. When it was over, uh, the World Herald said, well, you got to have a big celebration, have a party, have fine. I said, where the hell are you going to have it? Well, might have in the auditorium or somewhere. You can't get 35,000 people in the auditorium. 30, I said, you're not going to have any party, but every man in town is going to be in on it. All these guys that had boots and old clothes on, slinging sandbags, they're going to be at the party, so we never had a party. Our major impression was that this disaster need not have happened. The river is predictable. They knew it was coming. It has come so often before. Man has a plan to control the river. The money has not been appropriated. It cannot be done just by the seven states who happen to be involved in this particular disaster. But I think our major impression had to do with people, of those who came down from the hills into the valleys to help their neighbors. And above everything else, our impression was that these people are worthy of their ancestors. Good night and good luck. The plan that Murrow talked about was the Flood Control Act of 1944, also known as the Pick Sloan Plan for the two men who conceived the idea. President Truman himself came to Omaha during the flood to see the destruction up and down the river. Then Fort Peck in Montana was the only dam completed. It was given credit for keeping an additional foot of flood water from reaching Omaha. Later that year, Fort Randall Dam was completed, followed by Garrison in 1953, Gavin's Point in 1955, Owahi in 1958, and Big Bend in 1963. Never before had such a massive project been undertaken. Thousands of workers, technicians, and laborers, tons of steel and concrete, acres of earth and rock. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers supervised the construction of the six dams on the Missouri River at a cost of $1.1 billion, $3.6 billion in today's dollars. It took nearly 30 years to build all six dams. In the 1930s, Fort Peck provided work for the unemployed of the Depression. Construction resumed on the other dams after World War II. Dams were built primarily for flood control, power generation, to irrigate croplands, and to facilitate barge traffic downstream. Fort Peck in Montana is the third largest dam in the world. The embankment is four miles long. Owahi Dam forms the longest lake of the six reservoirs, 230 miles. The six reservoirs can hold enough water to cover the entire state of Nebraska to a depth of 18 inches.
From Sioux City to the mouth, the wide Missouri gives way to a fast-flowing ribbon of water. The river has been channelized, banks stabilized with piling and rock to reduce erosion and keep the river from meandering. It's now a single, narrow, deep channel to facilitate navigation. That in itself is controversial today because of the loss of wildlife habitat and recreational opportunities. The nature of the river throughout the basin has been forever changed, and increasingly, the environmental loss is being questioned. But after the 1952 flood, there was little thought of that. Remember all the flooding on the Platte River in 1978? We would have had the same on the Missouri River that year, nearly as bad as the 52 flood, had it not been for the dams on the Missouri River. Back in the 50s, the goal was to harness a river that man could not control. And man succeeded on a massive scale.